I've got six o'clock, and we'll call this meeting to order. Roxanne, if you'll take roll. I've got Nick on speakerphone here, and if we'll all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Has council had time to review the agenda? I make a motion that we approve the agenda set forth in the packet. Second. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor, please show a voting sign. Nick. Aye. Public comments. Are there any public comments? Okay, I will skip that and go to the consent agenda. Has council had time to review the consent agenda? Are there questions? Second. A motion's been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please show a voting sign. Nick. Aye. Motion passes. Item A, safe base. Angela. I brought my comments. No, oh, yeah. Watch those cords. Bring it all over. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I'm Angela Henry and I'm the director of the Safe Base After School Program. We are the after school program for the Iola School District. Um, this is our 21st year of operation. We serve students during the school year K through sixth grade and we are a free program. And so right now we are applying for another five year grant. Um, the state through the Kansas State Department of Education and that provides the bulk well, the overwhelming majority of our operating funds. And the city in the past, two different times, has partnered with us. Um, this year is ending the fifth year of a five-year agreement where you were providing um, $5,000 a year that went for our supplies. And without that, we we have right now in this grant $111 budgeted for our supplies for the entire school year. Um, the grant is $75,000. They've actually changed it to where um, this grant will actually be $100,000 for three years, and then it goes down to where I believe it is eighty-five and seventy-five, the fourth and the fifth year. So we are asking for you to continue our partnership the state looked very favorably on that um, relationship that we had. They are anticipating over 80 applications. They think that they will be giving away possibly 10 to 12 awards. Um, so we are looking somewhere in the neighborhood of 450,000 over the course of five years, somewhere in that neighborhood. And we are asking for you to partner with us again uh, 5000 a year for a total of 25000 which would help us leverage um, that th this, those grant funds and would allow us to continue operating past the school year. Um, we do have one other grant. It's also 75000 It is ending next year. So we would have to write another application, have to be selected again um, for us to, con to operate at, at the capacity in which we are operating. The grants keep getting smaller and smaller. Um, the money in this grant, uh, I don't know, like 10 years ago, we had for the month of June. So we only approach you when we really need the funds, um, not just for the partnership. Obviously, the partnership is incredibly beneficial to us. You help us with the space for the garden. You lease us the pumpkin patch. Um, in 2016, when we started our last partnership on the last grant that's ending this year, we were asked to uh, present at the Kaufman Foundation. Um, then Mayor Wyckoff uh, went with us, and he presented with uh, Kansas City Mayor, Kansas City, Missouri Mayor Sly James, and Leewood Mayor 
uh, Peggy Dunn about our partnership and their partnership with their after school programs. And again, we serve about um, normally 130 to 150 kids an afternoon. Currently, we're somewhere about 78 kids. On Wednesdays, we have 90 kids, um, and the program is free. When you look at the school district's free and reduced lunch, um, which lunch percentage, which is indicative of um, childhood poverty, we are actually uh, serving a higher percentage. The district is somewhere, I believe, I'm, I'm ballparking, I think we're about 59% district-wide, and safe base is about 75%. So if you look at the elementaries, of course, that does go higher. I think the highest school is about 65%, but we're still 10% higher than that school is as far as the percentage of students that we serve. So we feel that um, our, our services are, are valuable, that they're needed. Um, we have an external evaluator that is required to evaluate us every school year. It's written into our grant. It's a requirement for application. And here are some of the feedback that parents gave, that I gave you, that parents gave last year on our evaluation. And then at the bottom, uh, we like to ask, you know, was it easier for them to work more hours? Was it easier for them to go to school? Um, do they feel we're a needed program? And you can see there that 64% said it was they were able to work more hours because of safe base, uh, and 72% said it was easier to keep their job or to go to school, and 96% said they felt safe base was a needed program in their community. And even with COVID um, last spring, we did not shut down in the sense that we went virtual. And so like uh, Mayor Wells read a book for us through our Facebook page. Um, it wasn't the most ideal situation, but it was how we were able to respond within a week to be able to maintain programming. Um, we've been recognized at the national level, um, the state level mul multiple times. I think we're in our sixth uh, time that the state has asked us to mentor other programs. And so I'm just asking that you uh, continue your partnership with us on this grant and that you would continue uh, allowing us to use those funds to do things like dissect impregnated sharks, to dissect squid, to um, do gardening, painting, cooking, all the different things that we do every day. So if you have any questions, I would be welcome to glad to answer anything. Angela, I'd like to commend you for running this program. I uh, hear a lot of good things about it. Um, aside from this grant, you say that you apply to the Kansas Department of Education. What, uh, what amount financially does 257 contribute? They contribute about $22,000 a year, and that money is uh, at-risk funds, and they are used to pay um, tutors to work with students who are struggling below grade level academically, and so we use those funds for that purpose to help with that. But they also, they're paying the custodians, they're paying the utilities, they're providing the busing, um, all of those different things as well, which we don't factor. And they're providing food service, they're providing payroll, um, all the financial book work that comes along with that. So the tutors are there participating and at the same time your pro program is going on? These would be either, these would, they can drop, they can, they can attend homework hotline, like they're enrolled, they have to be enrolled to come to Safe Base. If a student feels like they need more time to work on their homework, or maybe it's to meet their, a, their accelerated reader goal, uh, their reading comprehension, they can choose to go into homework hotline. It's a little different this year with COVID. Um, if they are, um, struggling academically and they've been referred to the program for academic assistance, then they go into the tutoring. So that happens Monday through Thursday. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, 410 to 520. Wednesdays, it's 350 to 520. This year, um, we have been so short with staff. We have a new partnership with the, uh, the Methodist Church group called By My Side Program, and they are helping provide some tutors. But that 22,000 we use to pay for those specific things, those specific salaries um, or hourly wages, I should say. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know that, and I said this before, even my own 
kid went to Safe Base and then worked for Safe Base and now teaches for the USD. I think it's a great program and it helps, you know, kids from all over the town, you know, all over town. And, and not only does it help them with homework, but the art, the cooking, the, like you said, the science. I think it's really valuable stuff for these kids and they've got some place to go after school, which as a working parent, if you're not off until five o'clock, by the time you get around, go get them, you know, I mean, and I had some days when I was late picking mine up <laughs> because I worked in Humble. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great program and I would um, I know I make, have, make a motion. Hey, hey, hang on a minute, oh. Nancy. <clears throat> I know I've stated, uh, before that uh, even today I still have kids and it's been five or six years since I taught that re recognized me as Mr. G from my time at Safe Base and I can't say enough about the program and how you run it Nancy or I mean uh, Angela and the wonders it's done for all the kids around and if nancy makes a motion i think she's going to make i'm going to second i'd, I'd like to ask another question uh, one of the reservations i have about this funding is why the city is involved in in subsidizing a school district function well um why do you think that that is appropriate well, one of the things I think is appropriate is in the very first year of Safe Base, we saw a dramatic decrease in juvenile crime. And it doesn't matter if you have a school-aged child, if your community's juvenile crime has decreased, you've benefited from your after-school program. If you want to look at it as economic development, um, I, I would be quite honest, I stopped keeping track, but somewhere along the line, we are over $10 million. And I don't write grants full time, but we're over $10 million that we brought into this community. And we pay salaries, and we try to buy stuff locally, and we try to keep the money in the community. And if the principal, the money turns over seven times before it leaves the community, that's an amazing amount of money. And we're asking for a five-year, $25,000 commitment. You know, when we're looking at bringing in somewhere in the neighborhood of 450000 what is What is the response of the school district to increase the funding so that that will cover your supplies rather than coming to the city to do it? Well, after I leave here, I'm going to the school board, and I'm asking the school board for funds for a summer program, and I'm asking them for $40,000 for three years. So I... I we need, we need the funds for the supplies. And we called, um, had, we had parents or guardians of 94 students return a survey this last week to us. And there were, I believe, I have my notes in the car, but I believe it was 78% of them said they wanted a summer program. They needed some sort of summer program. It's been a while since we've been able to do that because the grants aren't there. Um, when Jean worked with us, we took kids camping. We take them on field trips. We we find things that are interesting that inspire them to learn and to do other things. And so I will be asking the school board when I leave here for basically $120,000 to to be able to do that for the next three years. Um, I, to me. We represent the city well. We're asked to go and, and rep, you know, present with other mayors, and it, I think it, it's a, a good reflection on our community. It seems like a good investment to invest in the youth. You hear that. So I think this is a good opportunity to do that. Ron, did you have a comment or a question? I saw you. I, I was going to make a motion, but I think this is, as far as I'm concerned, it's a small drop in the bucket. Anything that we can do for the kids, you know, as, as a council, we don't really do a lot for the kids that actually makes a direct impact. And I think this is probably one of those things that does make a direct impact with at least 100 kids every single day of the week. And I think it's great. And, and thank you for doing it for everybody. And, you know, I think it probably helped. The kids that that wouldn't get the chance that they have if get a job we keep talking about um not having the workforce that we need this you know I, I, where would we be at if we didn't have it hey ron i i taught a some sort of a military combat i don't remember what it was drill and ceremony or something 
And there's been three kids that went through that program that's went on to the military and are still right. actively participating Nancy, in the military good. today. I, Nancy, you I would motion, say it please. also, it, it does give our youth, high school age kids that come in and they work and they get a job and this is their after school job as well. So again, you're you're recirculating that money in our community and it's the least we can do. So I would make the motion that we um, go ahead with the request for the five year funding commitment of $5,000 annually for the Safe Base after school program. Would you I make sure you amend that to make sure that if the grant is approved, I think is... Yeah. It, it would be contingent on contingent approval. Contingent on the grant approval. Okay, before we have a vote, where does the where does the funding for this come from? Carl, we've historically taken it out of the council's discretionary funding, and uh, we didn't decrease that line item from the budget. So I mean, there's funds there. So where was the total budget for the year? Do you know that? I'm guessing ten or twelve thousand dollars. I mean, that may not even be that high. It may be about seven. Seven or eight, I thought, uh, but I could be wrong. And, I mean, that's where we funded the community garden in the past, the, the utilities that we've waived down there, and a few other things that uh, you guys have done in the past. So if we approve this, then most of the budget for council discretionary funding would be used up for the year? Dean, are you going to second that? I second that motion. Okay. Carl, do you have any other questions or comments? Well, the... I, I think it's a great program. My reservation is just the fact that the city is subsidizing a school district program, and I think those funds rightfully should come from the tax base of the school district, not just the city. Well, I think we like to think of it as really, it's truly a partnership. We have applied for grants in the past where um, half, uh, we, we were able to find funding for a second person to work at the park and rec. That person worked um, at the park and rec in the morning. They worked in the afternoon for safe base. We've written grants to pay for a $10,000 drug trailer. We've, you know, for the sheriff's department, we've worked with the police department. The police and sheriff's department helped us put in the garden and so we don't really see it just as a school district program. We see it as this kind of community program. And the more partners and the better collaboration we have, the better the program is and the better the services are for the kids. So um, I, I guess that's the way I see it to me. You know, we it just seems like a, a good use of funds to 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 have this program if we didn't have it where do these kids go i think the community tends to think that we're going to get these grants and don't realize how competitive they are um and and we just have a great program and we do a good job and um this partnership with the city will strengthen our proposal. It will, by having the partnership with the city, I think will set us ahead of other proposals. Hopefully we'll get selected and we'll be bringing in somewhere in the neighborhood of $450,000 over four years. And then we would be going back next year and writing another grant, which we would not come back and ask you for another 5,000. So let's say we get both grants, say they're somewhere near $900,000. I would think 25,000 would make sense to, to partner for that kind of money coming into the community. I've got a motion in a second, so I'll go ahead and call the question. Uh, the motion on hand is to fund uh, 25,000 over five years, depending on uh, contingent on the grant. It has been seconded. All those in favor, please show a voting sign. Nick. <laughs> Mayor Austin. Uh, motion passes. Okay. Thank you for your time and for your help. And, and just while I'm right here, um, when we were, our goal is to have this application done by March the 10th. Um, since can I come back and ask for your signature, John, on the proposal with Stacy Fagers? Okay, thank you, and I appreciate if you, your questions. If you'll just leave it with Roxanne or whatever, or if you leave it at the main office, I can run down to Stacy's office That'll, too and sign it. You won't have to come back and ask for it at okay. the council meeting. Just bring it to us and we'll get his signature. Yeah, or, or just let me know and I can go over to the, the school office. Okay, and then they anticipate uh, to make award notices in June um, okay. before July 1st. Okay, if you'll let us know and we'll make sure the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Item B, uh, CMB. Uh, Mayor and Council, in closing your packet is the loan CMB license renewal that we were missing uh, at the end of last year. 
Coronados has uh, finally got his application in and hit all the needed uh, updates out there by the fire department and the police department. Uh, so we're asking for you guys to approve his CMB for this calendar year. I'll make a motion to approve the list of CMB applications. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please show a voting sign. Nick. We may have lost him. That's okay. Motion passes. Item C. All right, uh, Mayor and Council, a few weeks ago, the Mayor and I was approached about uh, erecting a recognition sign uh, for Lieutenant Governor David Toland as being the home of, of him. I did do some checking just to make sure that KDOT was okay with it, because it is a U.S. highway. I finally got word back from them today that they're fine with us installing the sign. Um, the only thing we've got to do is fill out a KDOT 304 permit, which is a right-of-way permit for them. And it's, uh, I mean, it's just a procedure we'll have to go through. Uh, in your packet, you'll find a, uh, a mock-up that I had Dane out at the storeroom talk to National Sign in Ottawa. It's where we get all of our street signs. Basically, it's a non-regulatory sign that's going to be uh, 48 inches by a foot tall. Uh, 48 inches long by a foot tall. It, uh, our thought is if you guys approve it, we'd underhang the city limits sign. We've got to do some moving <laughs> around with some signs. Uh, I think on the west side we've got uh, Funston Home and the Bolus. We'll move them up into town a little bit farther on some existing poles or on some signs. And then we'll underhang. Uh, the only thing that I found, I had Roxanne uh, reach out to the city clerk's listserv. We didn't find that there was any cities that actually had a recognition sign for a lieutenant governor. Everything we've seen was for the governor itself. Uh, you know, with that being said, I don't know that it's not warranted. I mean, it's a pretty inexpensive thing. Uh, it is a good accomplishment for Mr. Tolan and our community to have somebody representing that, that office. Uh, I would I would generally suggest the basic rule would be any statewide elected official or any national elected official, congressman, um, et cetera, should get some recognition. This just happens to be the first and, and highest office. The, the signs itself are pretty inexpensive. They're, I, I want to say, I, did I say $81? $81. $81. $81 a piece. So, you know, 160 well, What was John Carlin? He was our mayor. Well, wasn't he a state official at one time? John Carter. And, and Carter, I mean, yeah. And this, was just this would be there. statewide, so not like representatives and state representatives, but state or national would be, I think, the idea. Um, similar to whenever we have a team that wins state, um, we recognize them coming in, uh, you know, 3A, 5A, 4A champion. Well, yeah, I understand that, but saying that they, he's the first one, well, We've had Stanley Greer as a, no, he'd be county. Right. I, as far as I'm aware, Gene, uh, David is the only one as far as within the incorporated city limits that had a place of residence and that I, I'm I aware of. Now, there may be, uh, oh, right, and he has a highway. So, <laughs> and I went back and looked, because I thought E.H. Funston, but E.H. Funston didn't live in lived city in limits Carlisle. proper. He lived, he lived outside, so. Uh, and if you guys choose to do it, uh, you know, we will, the signs will order them, and I don't know how long, it won't take terribly long to get them, but uh, the shipping, the only thing is we may wait and see if somebody's going to Ottawa before we have them ship them, because it'll probably cost 40 or $50 to have them shipped versus somebody going to National Sign or going through Ottawa to pick them up. What uh, funds is this going to come out of? Uh, we would likely take it out of just Dan's traffic control signs, or his signage. We just actually got an order and went up and got them a week ago, so it was kind of a little late, but uh, yeah, we'd probably just take it out of street department's uh, signage line item. So are we looking at four signs then? No, just two. We would just direct them at the east and west. We really don't have a good place to put them north and south, and anywhere that I've seen, at least from me traveling through the state of Kansas, they're always on the highway uh, entrance of, of town, and we don't have any regulatory control over 169. Uh, uh, city limits wise so we wouldn't put anything on 169 well I think it's nice to honor somebody I just don't 
agree, particularly with political advertising. I mean, that's what appears to me. I think regardless of party, we'd put up the sign for, for somebody at that level is the idea. If, if you reach a statewide office, um, in there, so, but that's up to the council's decision. I'm okay with it. If you want to go ahead and make a motion and see how, how the votes fall. Sure, I'll make a motion that council um, go ahead and purchase and install the signs recognizing Iola as the home of the 52nd Lieutenant Governor David Toland. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, please show a voting sign. Opposed? Kim, did you vote? Okay. Motion passes. Economic development. Uh, Carl. I'm going to hand this off to Carl. He provided all the information that you have in your packet and, and let him explain what he put in and then see where it goes. You've been doing some homework, haven't you? Uh, I want to say to start, I invited Liz and uh, Jonathan to come here so they can be part of this discussion. And I hope uh, that this is not, what I'm, what I'm hoping for is that this would be a discussion of what you like about our econ economic development policy and any ways you think we can improve on what we're doing. So. I included a few pieces of information um, that I picked up. Uh, the first article is just something I found in doing some internet research. It just turns out that the Federal Reserve banks of different areas do research on economic development issues. And that kind of uh, gave a nice summary of some evaluation they have done on the type of incentives. And I believe this is mostly addressing what states give. It does not, doesn't specifically say this, but I believe the nature of the article was uh, states provide a lot of money to big companies to attract them to build plants or whatever. So their basic summary was uh, there's a lot of competition between states in attracting companies, but there is no clear way to evaluate the effectiveness of the incentives that are granted uh, because there's, there's no way of uh, assessing apples to apples from one state or one project to another. So their summary of why it's done is for political gain by either economic development entities or the state elected officials. So, you know, it's uh, the people I talk to say, well, you know, it's just part of the competition that we have to engage in in order to attract businesses. So that's the first article. The second, um, there's seven pages of economic data summary that comes that is for the state of Kansas. This is generated by the uh, oh, let's see KU University. KU. Uh, let's see. What's the name of this? Institute of Policy and Social Research. Thank you. Anyway, I, I talked to um, Craig Van Way to try to get some numbers on where our labor force, how it uh, is divided among different categories and how it's fluctuated over the years, and he referred me to this information. So the first uh, seven pages are just for the state of Kansas, and it shows the population from 2020 to 2019, then personal income, how it's varied, changed over the years, and other statistics. And then the next set is just for Allen County. So the same type of data, how our population has gone from 14,393 in year 2000 and has declined to 12,369 
in the graph just shows a pretty pronounced uh, situation of how our population continues to decline in Allen County. In spite of that, uh, per capita income has gone up. It pretty much mirrors the state of Kansas. Our employment and civilian labor force. So what do you think about that? Going from 7,100 to 7,010. So there's not been a great big change in the civilian labor force in 20 years, even though the population has dropped by 2,000. So the labor force has gone down uh, just about 150. That's only for 10 years. Next page shows the 2019 is dropped oh, about thank you. 15 years. Thank you. Okay, 6,400. So it has gone down 600. But it's not quite as uh, pronounced as the population decline. So these two sets of numbers, first for the state and then for the Allen County, fit into the category on the second page of our agreement with Thrive that says uh, maintain accurate data about county and city demographics, sites, facilities, and labor that are relevant to current prospective businesses. I'm not an economist, so I don't know how to how I would analyze this, but it just kind of gives a picture of of how uh, labor numbers in different categories, manufacturing, retail, educational, have varied over this 20-year period. Okay, I would like to uh, ask a couple of questions just to get feedback of the council. I, I thought, well, if I drafted a policy that might address some of my concerns, um, I think it would be incomplete without getting the input of council on what your preferences are. And then uh, the other thought was, here I am as a council member, but I am not a small business owner. I do not operate a business. And I don't have the perspective that a business person might have on what they think works here in Iola and what they would like to see the city council do that might benefit them, whether it's retail or uh, industrial. So I was hoping that we could have kind of a short discussion here about what things you like about our current policies and what things you think we could do to improve on what we already have. Yeah. I've gotten some good feedback with the small business development um, centers that we've been funding for about the past, what, four years, three years? Um, I do like that. Um, it does get quite a bit of use, particularly um, both existing and new businesses. I would say that we continue that partnership. Um, I've, I've had really good feedback of them and, and teaching just some skills of like QuickBooks and other things and some business plans. So I, I would encourage us to keep that as we move forward. I mean, that's not really in this, but, but I know I, that it's part think, of our tools. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, thing. When I was living up in uh, Brown County, they had the Northeast Kansas Enterprise Facilitation Group that was funded through the Department of Commerce. And it provided the, kind of the same type of support. So that, I think that's a great effort. So is this basically boils down to redoing a policy to pick and choose who and how these businesses that approach us, how we're going to choose and pick, how and who we help? Is that what we're trying to do now change our policy to well, i think that started out with that as a question because of the request we were getting on electric hookups but i thought you know i'd rather not just focus on that but make it a broader policy to cover what we think works that would stimulate e economic development 
Well, Carl, a few years ago, I made the, I sat right here in this exact seat, and I made the comment, well, I was down there, I made the comment that I work in Chanute about daily, and I go through Humboldt and Chanute both. And I said back then, two years ago, if Iola didn't wake up and start doing something, after seeing what Chanute and Humboldt has brought in, that we're so far behind then, if we didn't start doing something, we're just going to get even further behind. What is that something? Well, what do you what do you see, all, what do you see that Chanute kind of, is doing? We was always kind of a tight blot on on what we wanted to do to entice new businesses to the city. So what did you what do you see in Chanute that you think uh, they're doing well? Well, I mean, I don't know what they're doing well or what they're doing to get these businesses and that loves and all that in there. But if you look over the last five years, Chanute has substantially gotten in major businesses that probably they have done some things to get them in that we don't know about. And that's what I said in that meeting or that night was, we need to decide and find out what these other communities are doing so we can start working on that. And John made the proposal a number of years back about we start putting some money back in an economical development plan, you know, so we could help, you know, if we had a business like, for instance, Perilous come to us, you know, we was able for once to offer a business something more than just uh, utility hookups, uh, tax abatement, you know, and, and, and that's what, I know that's some of what Chanute has done. They, and of course, they got the money where they can because of ASCRO, but, you know, Chanute has offered more incentives than what we could then, and I understand that. And I just don't want to see the city going to the thing where we're going to start choosing who, when, where, and how we're going to help potential businesses relocate or expand in Iola. I think that what we need to do is when we have a business come to us and say, hey, I'm looking at potentially relocating to Iola. What can you do for me? We need to take those individually case by case and have an open ear and listen to both sides of the story instead of just having our mind made up that, well, you know, the only thing we're going to give you is free utility hookups. <laughs> You know, we need to, we as a council, we need to figure out, figure this out so Iola can be more attractive. And Carl, I don't know the answer. Okay, I would like to get uh, input from other council members. I think that's what we're trying to discuss, our guidelines to set forth to help us make those decisions. I mean, you know, I work in this community. We also have a business in this community. We bought a dilapidated factory and took advantage of the neighborhood revitalization program. That is really important, and it's important for these businesses to know that that is out there and available. Um, you know, we're, we're dumping money into a building and creating new businesses and giving a, an old terrible building new life but I think it's a matter of we're trying to figure out what are those guidelines we don't have the money to throw at all these so are you talking about guidelines and tools to use yes. besides and okay. I think that that's part of it is knowing okay if you go to the city and you're a new business and you want to know what's available. If, if we had stuff to give them, if we had resources to give people that talk about neighborhood revitalization, that talk about these different things, so you've got a new business packet put together that you're going to give. A marketing piece, basically. You're just going to boil down to, to a marketing piece with information of 
you know, where to get help? Where is the, uh, you know, the small business, where are they located at? Where do we go talk to them to, to find out their resources? Who do I talk to about neighborhood re revitalization? Where do I get that paperwork to fill out? What does that essentially do for me and my business? So, so yeah, so I, that's, that's a good point there. Um, Jonathan sent me a, a copy of Fort Scott's uh, and it's just, it's the Bourbon County, right? Yeah, Bourbon County. And they had kind of a summary of the incentives that they would offer and how they would judge them. So, yeah. Could you okay. forward that on? Yeah. The council. I think that might be something interesting. And I think that's what we're discussing. Are those yes. guidelines? Yes, yes, guidelines. We because don't. Because we do have to decide, okay, where do we have the money? How much money do we have? I, how much money can we allot? I think too that we may need to differentiate between like industrial and yes. commercial okay. and residential in, in that those are very different yes. beasts. And I think too what goes into any of those decisions is ultimately jobs and, and manufacturing uh, when you're talking you know 100 employees versus 20 like of course you need to factor those in but I also think we should factor in energy usage. Like we know like Peerless is going to use some energy. Russell Stover's expanding gates. They use a lot of energy. Um, so what I hear you saying, Nancy, is some guidelines that would say, okay, here's a potential company. What incentives do we have and what, how do we rate or how do we decide what is appropriate? To yes, give or I mean, and just provide. having those that information available in a marketing packet that you can actually hand to that potential business that already has things outlined, so they know how we do things, what we're about, what are you know those tools that are already there that they're not going to have to come to us, like neighborhood revitalization. That that is those are forms you fill out. I, yeah, so we have I listed the what. Uh, we have paid out through our neighborhood revitalization, and this is this goes on our state uh, our state budget forms that we report to the state each year, and it reflects. Uh, I suppose you could look at it as lost revenue for the amount of property tax that is rebated to those look property owners. Ways, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's lost, lost revenue, but it's not. It's not revenue you're getting anyway because they're not they haven't done that expansion mm -hmm. potentially because of not having that neighbor but the state does require it on the budget forms because they want to keep track of right of where that revenue i goes. do know the nrp that a lot of homeowners themselves really like it and so, so do businesses when they are fixing it up if they're going to do something that's just aesthetic uh, i know um, the, when I was talking with the feedlot, and they they liked that program because they just did an aesthetic upgrade, which they didn't need to do, but they liked the idea of hey, we're not going to get penalized for making our building look better, and you know, in the short term, they understand in the long term that those revenues will eventually come back to us. And that's where it helped us a lot with that old warehouse that we we purchased, and you know, and we've sunk a lot of money into it trying to make it better and create some other businesses in there so but that was one of those programs that had i not probably been involved in this aspect of government i may have never known about i mean i think there's a lot of people that don't know about things like that i i do think one of the unique things we can offer we don't offer them terribly often but usually for utility for heavy heavy industry, um, I like having some of those utility incentives in our, as arrows in our quiver that we, that we can offer that, you know, other, other places can't, like Humboldt doesn't own the full service spectrums, we can offer things that they can't, um, we don't use them very often, but, but I do see them as an important tool, um, at least, and again, I don't have a good answer on how and when, and how much, but at the same time, I think I think there's something that we can use that it does entice. You know, we, we have competitive rates to begin with. Yeah, hard to hit that target. I mean, your target's always kind of moving depending on what you're looking at. If it's commercial, you know, retail versus industry, housing, it, it's so hard to to find that bulleted list because everybody's going to be a little different when they come in to ask you for something. Um, I like the idea of having that bulleted list of the five or six, ten things, whatever potential things that you could do, not to say that the council has to give those things, yes, but uh, have those things on For example, list. when I looked at uh, Payola's 
uh, economic development policy, they had a, a list of what they will consider. Wichita has a uh, economic development committee. They have a list of all the state, you know, places you can go. They also have a what they call if the business is coming in, are they value added jobs? Are they with health benefits or are they without? And then they're put in different brackets yes. on what they can get that way. So any other comments, Mark? I couldn't find any place in Kansas that, that they had electric hookups, you know, as an incentive, you know, but all of it was tax based, you know, giving them either tax or or uh, a monetary type thing. But most of them, like Wichita, it was strictly uh, tax incentives. You'll see that a lot in the larger cities. They don't have their electric utility like we do. I mean, uh, there's not a lot of cities that, that have that that I'm capability. Just, you know, doing like we've been doing, sure. hooking them up. Because that might be an extra feather in our cap that we can do that. I think, too, part of, the, part of the nice part on some of those utilities is that we can... I don't say inflate the number, but we say this is what it's going to cost with labor and equipment. And while those are real costs, they're not fully actualized cost of here's a check for X number of dollars, right? Well, and I like that idea of this is the list of things we will consider. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going right. to get it, but these are things that we do, we will consider, and we will look at. You know, all on a case by case base, basis in your business and like Mark was saying how many jobs are they jobs with benefits jobs without benefits what kind you know I mean taking I, that stuff into consideration I do like that categorization so the, the other thing that I think we are lacking is we don't have some kind of way of an an, analyzing and providing some kind of agreement okay if we provide these incentives what criteria are we going to base them on? Is there going to be some kind of contract so that if you pull out in 30 days or 60 days, are we going to lose whatever incentives we've given to that company? Kim, what's your comments? <laughs> <laughs> well, Iola doesn't have a Joe Works like Humboldt. There's the number one it, thing. It makes a difference, it doesn't it? Does. It does. I think we should have, like Nancy said, um, what they're bringing to the table, how much we're willing to give them. And do we have a fund of economic development that we take? We typically on those, Nancy, or uh, Kim, on this, sorry, <laughs> you're right beside me. Uh, uh, I mean, if it's, if it's industrial, like Peerless, we do have the industrial fund that we can do that. And we've, we've used that in the past for some of the smaller businesses as well. Uh, the industrial fund is probably a bad term for, for that fund. Budget but. for that every year? Some well, kind of I, yes, I think we should include some criteria so that when we look at these proposals. Somebody comes and asks us for. Well, ideally, when somebody comes in for that request, like uh, Mr. Lamb, whoever it is, they come in for that request. In theory, it'd be nice to be able to have that that economic development fund that has that twenty thousand dollars allocated or whatever it is, so you can recoup or put it back towards your electric fund that you waive those fees for. I mean, ideally, that would be nice. But right now, we're absorbing it through our utilities, our electric fund, or the gas fund, whoever it is that we waive the fee for. Yes, yeah, so it'd be nice to have some kind of contract with them. Right. I, I think if we're getting into commercial, we should also look at at sales tax right. you know if we're doing if we're doing the motor if we're doing because you know i'm trying i'm trying to think of the last one that we did the sigs they may not have a lot of employees but they may do a lot of sales what do you mean we should look at sales tax um if, if they're you know what, what's their projected sales if they're going to do 500 plan that right and for something that's fairly established i imagine the sigs know that what their sales tax is going to be that they right. paid it to the county now they're going to start paying the city one. If you hit this number, right. essentially this baseline number of sales or whatever, that could help you get into this other incentive or whatever. Ron, what's your comments or your thoughts? I think that economic development has, has, a, has a thin line between a city and a private entity doing it. What do you mean by that? As far as how involved a city needs to be 
with economic development and giving incentives and, and things of that nature. And if you think back to the grocery store that they put in Moran, that they redid in Moran, the county had made a board to determine if that, if that place was going to be economically feasible and being able to sustain. And they got a group of the best business people that they could find in the city, within the city and county. Financials and everything else. And they came back and they said, this does not meet what we should be able to, what you guys should be able to put money into. And they did not recommend that they got money. And the county not the county's money, that's our money that's going to out to Moran to fund a private business. And that's what I have uh, that's what I have a problem with is that when you start getting into big incentives of of if we brought in a another grocery store, well, now it's competing against somebody else that may have paid their entire way in. I think that is probably giving some sort of privilege to whoever's coming in that they might be getting something that somebody else did not. There were a lot of people that were upset about that money going out to Moran, and I believe it went down to Humboldt too when they were starting to do this, the grocery store down there. A lot of people are upset about their tax dollars going out to Moran to fund a grocery store. So what would be your, your recommendation? So just listening to everybody else, I think that everybody wants to do something to help businesses and trying to decide what it's going to be. And it sounds like it needs to be a weighted system, a weighted scale of if you're going to hit a million dollars in revenue, then that gets you so many points. If you're going to hit 25 employees, it's going to get you so many points. And then those points would determine what type of incentives we might offer? Or if you even qualify. Um, I so it would be based on some kind of a business plan that they would put together? That they would be required to hit, yes. Energy usage, I think, should be in there. Um, but as far as just giving cash, I think that should be used very, very sparingly. Well, typically in the past, cities did not get involved in giving incentives to retail establishments, only industrial. I mean, Lisa, would you say that's correct? Jonathan, would you say that's typical? Fair, yeah. Um, the information you sent me on Fort Scott, do you th would you say that they have a fairly good program to analyze the type of incentives they might give? I, wanted, um, I just want to delineate, there is a difference between Fort Scott and Bourbon County. They have two separate economic development arms, and this is Bourbon County, and I just want to make sure that okay. we're quoting the right place. So Bourbon Thank County, you. sorry, that's, no, I just yeah. wanted you guys to hear that. Now, what was your question, Carl? Well, would you say that they have a good plan or a program for assessing uh, what type of company that is coming in and to determine what type of incentives might be appropriate? So you've known Jody sorry, longer than I. Um, so I think that that would be further conversation to have with Jody, and that's easy to do. Um, one of the things that on what we'll forward you guys, what Jonathan will forward you, um, that Jody shared with us three weeks ago now, two weeks ago, uh, really talks about, it goes county incentives, state incentives, federal incentives, and what's available. And on the county side, they're grants. So it's saying, you know, per employee, you can get up to this amount of money for a grant, or you can get this kind of utility um, savings for however they do that. And what I, what I like about grants, um, as I think about it, is you're not guaranteed when you apply for a grant. We know that. <laughs> um, you hope to get it. So they're applying for something that they might receive, uh, and then a grant is not paid back. Um, so they're, they're given this grant to move forward with their project. And when you do a grant, you sign a contract that states the money will be used in this fashion, and if it's not, it can be repaid or it might be made to be repaid. And so those are parts of it I like. D to the exact question you're asking though, Carl, I don't have enough information to answer that yet, but we can get it for you. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah. Ron, did you have something else you were going to say there before I catch um, off? There, there are two things. One thing I think we should add, add into whatever we do is uh, valuation that they're going to bring to the city as well. Uh, about general building valuation. And then the, uh, the other thing that you had asked what, what people had heard is I've heard from a lot of people in the past about not so much as necessarily doing things for new businesses, but doing things for existing businesses especially when they get into hardships. And I would agree with that too. If we have an, an existing business that whether they're wanting to expand or something's happened, we should have programs out there to help keep those existing businesses in place and not lose them. I mean, they're, they're somebody, that's a business who's been in our community who has, you know, given to the community, most likely, most likely donated things to the community, paid taxes, you know, all that. And we should have things in place to help those, those existing businesses as well. Really quickly, Carl, just say I'm really glad that you guys are having this conversation because it's something that I think it was about a year and a half ago. I know I sat down with Sid. Corey, I feel like I've had this conversation with you and with Mayor Wells as well. We really do need guidance from you guys. And when we put out um, responses to RFPs, for instance, that the state uh, sends us, right now we have a document that says, we can discuss incentives with you. And so they, they know right from the beginning, they're like, okay, so you guys don't really know what you're doing with incentives then, unless we come in and talk with you about it. What we need is to be able to tell industrial employers and small business owners, this is what we have. Need your baseline. This is the baseline, because we don't have much on those documents right now, because we've never had something like this written. And so I'm really excited that you guys are talking about it, because I think it only helps us especially Jonathan, now that he's taken the lead on this, to be able to work with these businesses. So thank you. One thing, and I'm just tossing ideas, one thing maybe to add in, into that if we're doing a weighted system like Ron, is some sort of value added, like, I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, medical arts or a, at one point we were talking about getting a dialysis center here, you know, something that's not here that would be a value added to the community, um, you know, if there was a new, um, and I'm just, you know, thinking that, that was going to add on to the hospital a some sort of clinic that we need in town. I don't know how you would give that a point-based system of, you know, what's the uh, what's the lifestyle addition that this is going to add to town. Does that make sense? I mean, there's not a, or maybe that there's not the existing business here at all. Could be could be the yes or no. There is not a dialysis center in the county. <laughs> But that would be, you know, Allen would, County. Or well, it's like having an OBGYN. It depends on what, right. right? How many people use it? Whether you can afford to. Say right, it. But, but I was thinking something like yeah. that when we're talking about the big and set, and that's kind of commercial or not. But okay, I didn't want this to draw on or okay. keep going on <laughs> here. But um, I thought it, it would be better to get inputs and then draft a policy and try to include those inputs, bring it back to the council, and then they'll say, okay, here's a start. What are the things can, do we want to add, or is, does, it, does this include all the things we considered? So I'd be, I'd be willing to work to draft it. I might just say, Jonathan, you do this, but... <laughs> I'd be happy to. Does it make sense I, to create like a subcommittee to work on this? And I think, um, you know, I, uh, I'm pretty good at plagiarism. I like to look at other communities and say, what looks good about your policies? How are you similar to our community? The other thing I've noticed is that larger communities offer very few incentives. It's only the smaller communities that are so excited about getting somebody to come that they're willing to give away a lot of things. Other larger metropolitan areas just generally say, here's uh, property, go ahead, pay your fees, and you can set up shop. So that's kind of the nature of things. So do you have any other suggestions before we take this and start with a draft and then bring it back to the council later? I, I would say that just makes me personally making sure that it's not going to put hardships on another business with the incentives that we're giving to somebody new coming in. Yes, I think that's important. We shouldn't provide something to one that's going to put another one at a... I would 
competition is always good, but when you when you give them a twenty thousand dollar leg up just for starting out, I don't think that's right. All right, thank you. Appreciate your inputs. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Carl. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, executive session order need ten. Fifteen. Let's start with fifteen and make sure that way we have enough. Okay. Don't we want to give us an exec for fifteen? City Council recess into executive session for 15 minutes pursuant to the contract negotiations, KSA 75. Okay. Purpose of the executive Mayor, Council, Interim City Administrator, and Fire Chief, the regular meeting shall reconvene the City Council Chambers at 7.15. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? Okay. I'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, we are now in line for council and administrator reports. Um, I'd like to go first today. Uh, I really want to thank all the city crews um, across the board, electric, water, um, everybody was uh, fire, EMS, police, and everybody that was out there this last week. Uh, you know, it was dangerous conditions. Uh, they really stepped up across the board, running generators 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, doing split shifts, not being at home. Uh, it really was a Herculean effort to protect our citizens and to make sure power was running and to make sure water was running. And if you look at, you know, just around the nation with water breaks, et cetera, at negative 20 degrees, uh, the city crews really need to be commended. Um, each and every one of them, they did a fabulous job. I, I really do. We are all in a debt of gratitude for them. Thank you guys and ladies. You know, thanks. Really, that's what, what my comment was going to be too. And it was really nice to come in tonight and it was still light out and most of the snow is gone. Thank you. I am just ready for warm weather. But thank you to all of our city crews. It was. Pass it along tomorrow at staff meeting. Yeah, it was great job by everybody. Same here. Glad I had power the whole time. <laughs> Gotta have power. Nope, they did an outstanding job. Thanks for every, everybody that, that did everything. And uh, um, I think we should start looking at how we're going to pay for the fire. We've got some money laid back already, but yeah, we will need to allocate some more. Likely the purchase will be next year anyhow. Well, I was thinking this week as I was preparing for the council meeting tonight that when you have an emergency situation where everybody's more interested in survival you're not thinking about your economic development or whatever but uh, I'm glad that we have great city crews that keep things going in spite of the cold weather I stopped in for just a few minutes out the electric plant and saw how they were trying to get the generators going with the diesel fuel turning to jelly and the breakers not working and working around the clock. So it's nice to see that our crews uh, made a valiant effort to generate the extra electricity for us. I'd like to say thanks to, to Hample Oil too for their work yes. on their trucks. And city, state trucks all across the board. Yes. They did, they did a lot. Yeah. So I, I mean it's not just the electric, it's all of the utilities that keep us going i'm not sure that we didn't have a crew or a department that wasn't either out over the weekend or out throughout the night i mean we had numerous water leaks we had some gas issues i mean it was the gamut i mean we obviously first time in a number of years i can remember we suspended trash service for a day just because of the cold temperatures and the truck we didn't want to chance the hydraulics and gelling up of that truck so uh, it was a unique week by by uh, our standards. That's it was so point. close, Corey. <laughs> so <laughs> close. It's not Carl, over yet. Carl, Carl, go ahead. Are you? Sorry, we interrupted. Carl. I'm finished. Thank you. Just thank you to all the city employees for what I considered last week going beyond and above the call of duty. Thank you, Corey. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick update. Uh, the, we're going to go ahead and start renting our buildings back out. We're going to kind of limit those to one rental a weekend just so we can let them set and be able to clean them. Uh, but we'll, we'll start that up this weekend. And 
As you know, I, I put in my weekly report, we had a bunch of uh, traveling teams and different people wanting to use the rec building because uh, the college facility is just so busy. Uh, we, we put administrative policy together for that, and Jason's going to start allowing that to rent when we have availability, you know, because obviously there's times that we just don't have the availability that these, these teams want to use it, but uh, with some rules in place with, so we don't damage our floor and infrastructure. Um, Department of Labor is supposed to be in was supposed to be in here last week, and they canceled due to the weather and things. That they come in about every two years and do an inspection of just our facilities. You know, kind of check the safety guards on different things. They're they're scheduled to be here, I believe, on Thursday this week now, to do those walkthroughs of our different facilities and kind of look at those things. Um, March eighth eighth council meeting. Uh, of course, Matt will be here to be his first meeting. Uh, Greg's got his dangerous unsafe structure public hearing and resolutions. Uh, I'm hoping to have the NNB contract renewal uh, to present to you guys. Bob's working on that. Uh, I mean, it's not going to be much different. We tweak those minimums just a little bit and put a little bit of wording in there to help us in case an industry shuts down that we don't need that we wouldn't have to be tied to that. But uh, we'll, we'll have that at the next meeting. I'm also going to have. Uh, Thrive will be here for the CDBG grant. We'll do the formal contract with Thrive to administer the grant, as well as signing the contract with Department of Commerce for the funding. Um, that'll be at your next meeting. And then uh, Mike and I have been talking about additional generation. We've got a quote from the gentleman we bought the two cats from uh, to get that third unit. Uh, we should. We're working the details of that out, and I'm hoping it'll probably be that March 22nd meeting before we bring a contract uh, to purchase that other unit. I just don't know that we can get Bob to get that contract tweaked by the time the 8th rolls around. Uh, and then uh, the trail project is moving forward. I got interviews on that this week for the grant application. And then uh, the Highway 54 stuff, I'll forward that out. I just haven't had time to review it yet. Uh, I think it's going to tell us pretty much, you know, what we knew that some of the base is terrible and the, you know, the asphalt's really holding the road up right now. But uh, I'll forward that out probably by the end of the week for you guys to review. And I think that's all I've got tonight, guys. Make a motion that we adjourn this meeting for the evening. Thank you. Uh, motion is made and seconded. All those in favor, please show a voting sign. Motion passes.